Hello, I am Jamie, a.k.a. Brandoff, the off-brand Gandalf, and today I'm going to review the brand new Ultra Edition of the Fist RPG. It is a rules light, paranormal, mercenary role-playing game, and spoiler alert, it's one of my favorite rules light games. So as with my last review, I'm going to take five pages or in this case two page spreads to illustrate the five things I really like about this game uh it's going to be sort of like a combination of just like a general fist review and highlighting things about the new ultra edition although I have had other videos on, on fist about why it's so cool uh the basic breakdown is this is a cold war era which covers a lot of ground I think most people tend to drop their games into the the 80s, early 90s, thereabouts. You play very much like a team mercenaries. Uh, it's the system is based on John Harper's World of Dungeons, which is essentially powered by the apocalypse without any moves or with only one move. You get like the nice dice curve. You get the mixed successes. It also has kind of like an OSR sensibility where the uh, characters are, are very easy to kill uh, so your your players will probably want to have backup characters or maybe a little stack of them at the same time though the their characters are going to be very powerful some of uh, the traits are as powerful as like a top tier D, D spell and you pick that right from the beginning so right from the start you can do really potent powerful abilities but at the same time, you aren't going to be an invincible superhero. It's kind of like every, I like to think of it as like everyone in the game is a glass cannon and you can go out in an amazing blaze of glory with having a lot of impact on the story. It's, it's really cool and it's a lot of fun to play. It's a lot of fun to run. You can see some of the uh, inspirations, Metal Gear Solid, the A-Team, Doom Patrol, Samurai Jack, World of Dungeons, Offworlders, Full disclosure, I play tested uh, Fist Ultra. I don't think that makes me biased, even though my name's in the book. <laughs> okay, I'm biased, whatever. This is a review from someone who has published add-ons for this game and loves it. So there you go. Um, okay, the first of the two page spreads here, we've got just the getting started and making mercs page. Um, Talks a little bit about play as a conversation, uh, that very like powered by the apocalypse. It's not rigidly turn based. Uh, over here we have making mercs. Um, you belong to a legendary rogue mercenary unit called Fist. You are a soldier of fortune who doesn't fit into mainstream society. You are one of the little guys caught up in the death and destruction of pointless proxy wars and oppressive establishments. You may be also be someone who can turn into a ghost or control bees with your mind. The paranormal secrets of the Cold War are your bread and butter, and you will fight for your life to make ends meet alongside others like you. I think it would make like for a good TV show, if anyone's listening. Traits are, uh, I kind of think of them as a combination of like a D&D &D feat, a little bit of starting gear, and a little bit of an attribute score adjustment. So the main thing, though, is, is the feat element. I think traits are the bread and butter of this game, and we will get to them later. Um, you have four attributes, forceful, tactical, creative, and reflexive. Uh, Fist Ultra has a very fate-accelerated approach to attributes. It's, uh, it's more like, what's your approach? Like, you have an AK-47, but what are you doing with it? Even if you're you're shooting, it could be like, I'm carefully, you know, taking aim. Uh, that could be tactical, or it could be like some if someone's like trying to respond to someone like barreling down a hallway with a knife, that could be reflexive. Or maybe they're just like kicking down a door and just spray and praying and, and firing at all the monsters inside. Um even though you're you're shooting an AK-47 in each of those three scenarios, uh, you could make an argument for forceful, tactical, and reflexive, and even creative. I mean, there's probably creative uses. But yeah, uh, I, I really enjoy 
how fluid the attributes are. It's, it's not as set as in other games, and it can help people think about how they're doing something rather than what they're doing. It's not just, I have a sword, that's strength. You know, there could be reflexive uses of swords, tactical, forceful. It, it kind of depends on, on how your character interfaces with the world. Up next, uh, you choose two traits from the trait index. There are now 2D666 traits. This is wild. Um, I haven't even read through them all because I, I like being surprised by them. Uh, so every now and then there'll be a trait I'm not familiar with and it'll be like, oh, this is exciting. We'll get to those later. Um, you fill out your attributes, your inventory, your armor, HP, and war dice. War dice are kind of like a meta currency. I was fortunate enough to play in a game jammed by Ripley, who helped write Fist, a lot of the cool traits. And she actually gave out war dice as kind of like d d inspiration. You know, like someone did something cool, so they got a war dice. Um, all characters start with zero, and they represent grit, spirit, and luck. War dice are used to alter roles, and <laughs> I've seen some really interesting discussion about what war dice can actually alter. Um, you can definitely alter the roles of your allies, but then you can alter the roles of the GM. Uh, why would you Why would you want to add to the GM's roles? Well, um, sometimes the GM will roll, uh, the referee will roll on a, a random table, and you can mess with that roll using a war dice. Um, there's been a few, like, pretty hilarious edge cases which i don't really want to spoil uh just i want to, i want you to see what kind of wild stuff your players can come up with this is the main reason i wanted to highlight this page with fist second edition it was written with the assumption that when somebody died which is very likely they just get to roll up a new player and throw him into the game but that wasn't in the text of the game uh fist ultra makes it explicit there's a new system called emergency insertion if your character dies create a fresh character while play continues when you're ready to deploy jump into the fray and roll 2d6 with six or less deployment goes wrong somehow seven to nine you deploy as normal 10 or above deploy with an extra standard issue item and double sixes as above but add plus three to your first roll um, and i am happy and uh, delighted to say that I actually inspired the, the double sixes change there. I thought it'd be cool if double sixes resulted in just like a super impactful, memorable entrance for your character. Uh, something that like people are going to cheer and laugh about. And, and now we have it right here. Double sixes plus three to your first roll. And that's in addition to any other bonuses you get. So um, hope for the double sixes. And if you're listening to this and in your games, you have witnessed a double six entrance, a double six emergency insertion, please comment and let me know the little story and I will, I will pin it or something. I don't know. Uh, Cause I have, I've yet to see a double sixes happen and I'm just like, I can't wait. Like I, I want, I want to see, I want to hear about them. Uh, then you, you choose your role. A role is, it's, you know, it's, it's the modern, it's like the modern approach to, uh, advancement that you see in a lot of games these days where character goals, uh, you, you know, at the end of the adventure, you ask questions like, did I achieve this goal? And your, your role kind of determines the, the goals and stuff. Um, some of the roles I've noticed are a little bit easier than others to achieve, um, a couple of them I'm not I'm not I'm not really sure what I I would do with. Most of them are straightforward and I think it's good to have a mix, but um I would maybe I would maybe have a talk with your players or hmm how to put this. I would I would talk to your players and just let them know that like some roles are probably going to be easier than others to hit, especially depending on the campaign, the scenario you're running. Uh it's probably a good idea to like throw your players a bone and like review the roles before you start a session and just be like, you know, maybe, 
maybe I'll try to do something for this player, or something for that player, not guaranteed, but just include it. You know, maybe there's a room and if they explore, their exploration is rewarded by a good chance of that role being fulfilled. Um, me personally, I don't, I'm kind of weird in that. Like, I don't really care that much about character advancement. Uh, I don't know. Like I just, I, I, as long as my starting character is, is can do a lot of cool stuff. I, it doesn't overly concern me when I'm not like unlocking a new trait or something every, every adventure. But for other players, I know that unlocking cool new stuff is like one of the main draws. And so just like be aware that like the role you pick will likely determine how quickly you advance. And then I believe uh, you can swap out roles after. But yeah, and, and uh, you can't choose a role someone else already has. Uh, I think I remember that being like a discussion during the beta of like, should that role be included or not? At this point, though, there's there's so many. There's like D66 roles. So um, there's plenty of roles to go around. It's not like second edition where there were like 12. Uh, it's fairly unlikely you're going to get two people with the same role. And you know, you're free to house rule it. You can have two people with the same role. Just, you know, maybe, maybe be aware of your players pulling some shenanigans and like, they all want to pick the same role. And then they're all like perfectly in sync about hitting these, these advancements, you know, like you don't want to have everyone pick the same role. And then there'd be like, drop the adventure. Let's just go do that one thing. Um, although maybe you could, that'd be kind of funny. You know, it's, it's the old dwarf party, but with, um, paranormal mercenaries and then you choose a code name and you you also pick a real name but you don't tell ever anyone not even the referee until the perfect dramatic opportunity occurs when i was in the fist ultra play test my perfect dramatic opportunity was the first thing i said was my real name and then getting super embarrassed because i hadn't read that part correctly and then like retconning it so i didn't share my real name that was that was fun. Uh, and yeah, so just this nice little page here. Um, I have, uh, I like it when games that are lethal, like Fist Ultra, have fast character creation. And you see here an emergency insertion. Oh, right here, the text doesn't even recommend having a stack of backups. You're supposed to make a fresh character while play continues. And that's totally possible because there's not a lot of derivative stats. There's not a lot of math. You can just roll for traits at random. You can, like your biggest decision if you just want to roll randomly is whether you want a uh, war dice, hit points, or I believe the, the standard item. And so like, you know, there's not a lot of like decision making. You could quickly make up a character um, or you could have a little stack ready. That's fine too. All right, so that's, this is the first spread I want to feature. All good stuff. Uh, and that double that double sixes edition is, is a delight. Uh, I don't know. I, like, I'm going to be happy every freaking time I see it. And I really hope that it makes for some fun games for people. And also, I want to say uh, big props to B who made the game. And, you know, thanks for listening to my feedback. Like, that's that's really cool. The next two page spread I would like to highlight is the referee FAQ. This is a new addition to ultra. It is amazing. I didn't even know this was going to be in here. One of the things that I, uh, I wasn't a big fan of D and D fourth edition, but I love the D and D fourth edition dungeon master guide. It provided guidance. It came up with a list of, of problems that you're probably going to face. And it put them in a very clear, easy to read, FAQ format. I don't know why the FAQ format has fallen out of fashion. Um, I realize it's more of like a like a mid to late 90s kind of thing, but I think it's an excellent resource for anyone trying to learn just about anything, you know? As a, as a game designer, you you listen to what people come ask, right? Keep an eye on the forums, keep an eye on your emails and on, on Reddit or whatever. And when people repeatedly ask the same thing over and over again, don't just go in and like clear up the text, create an FAQ. Um, I had a ton of questions when I was, was learning, for instance, like tricube tales. So, and, uh, Richard Rollcox, Admar, he was kind enough to answer all my questions very patiently, patiently. And, um, 
based on the stuff that confused me about the game. When I did uh, Relay Watch, which is based on Tricube Tales, I included an FAQ page. Uh, and because I, you know, these are the things that I anticipate people are going to be confused about. Because it's it's easy to miss a rule, right? Um, even if rules are light, even if the layout is good, it's easy to to miss a rule, especially in the heat of the moment. And you're like, oh my god, I I don't know how this works. I don't know. I'm a, I'm I'm just a huge fan of the FAQ format, and I, and I love that it's in this book. And I I love some of these questions that are answered. I'm just going to pick a couple here. Um, how do I move a spotlight between the players? This is possibly a big point especially if you aren't used to power by the apocalypse games if you you and your group are as is very likely used to D&D 5th edition or any turn-based game uh spotlight initiative can feel unnatural and i i, I think that like maybe spotlight feels the kind of like free form play as a conversation feels more natural perhaps to people who have never played an RPG and it feels weird to people who are used to structured play. And so I've seen like, you know, more than a few people in, in any game with, with free form initiative struggle with it, especially if you're, if you're just trying to, if you're a new referee and you're just trying to try out this game, how the heck do I, do I do this? And so right here we have uh, the answers. Try to think of, <clears throat> and so we have the answer. Try to think of, of your game like a movie and then quote okay you're trading blows with the power armor werewolf let's cut away and check on everyone else choose tense times to qu cut away like mid fight or while hanging from a cliff so that moving the camera is part of the fun you should also pay attention to which players aren't getting enough screen time and create relevant challenges for instance a mostly social character may not have much to do during combat, so throw in a scared civilian or two cowering behind a flipped truck. Remember too that the remember too that you can always ask the players directly if anyone needs some screen time. That's great. Uh, that paragraph says a heck of a lot. Later in the book, uh, I believe there's a an optional rule for for more strict initiative. Um, here, here's another great question because actually I think these two questions right here, these are some of the questions that are going to come up most, uh, from new referees to fist. How do I handle partial successes, especially in combat? Um, don't worry too much about it. All you have to do is think of ways that things could go sort of wrong. You probably do this all the time already. Those groceries are slipping out of my hands. I might need to crab walk up the stairs. If that light turns red before I get there, I'm going to be five minutes late. If I phrase this wrong, I could offend the person I'm talking to. Simple mundane complications like these are just as compelling as narrative flourishes and twists. For additional inspiration, try using the partial successes table. And that's another thing that uh, me and B kind of independently came up with is I also had an emergency partial success chart over in my toolkit. There's similar kind of takes on it, but you know, uh, her chart's different than mine, and I think you could like mix and you could have them both on like two different pages. Uh, more random tables are always a good thing. And to kind of summarize these two pages here, I am a firm believer in GM advice. I I read it compulsively. I like putting it in in all my games. I happily help people out. These two pages are exactly the sort of things I would put in one of my games. I think like some of the best forms of GM advice, GM tools, whatever you want to call it, is when a book saves you the trouble, right? Like that's why we buy pre-written campaigns because we don't want to make a campaign. And when a pre-written campaign expects us to do extensive work, even after we paid for the book and like it doesn't work out of the box, that feels bad. And likewise, when a game anticipates a lot of the problems you might have as a new referee, as a new GM, and kind of provides this kind of assistance for you, that takes a load off your shoulders. And the less work there is for referees to do, the more people are going to want to run games, the less intimidating, the less challenging it'll be for them to get started. And more people running games of Fist means I can play Fist more often. So these two pages are great. Uh, hats off for the referee FAQ. 
Yeah, for my next two-page spread, I'm just going to cheat, and uh, I'm going to pick a couple of random traits out of the two, uh, excuse me, out of the D666 table. Uh, there are, I think that's 216 traits, which is an amazing amount of, of combinations for beginning characters. Um, I dare say in, in, a, in a group, it's doubtful any two players will be alike. There's not going to be like, you know, two fighters or two pilots. You're going to have like someone who's aquatic and an aimbot and, and someone, I mean, even in like the A's here, someone who's an ace astronaut. Uh, there's a ton of variety. Anyway, I'm going to roll up a couple of traits and we're just going to go there. So 30, three, five, one. Let's see what we have here at this huge list. Limit. When pushed to the brink of your capacity for punishment, you unlock new wells of power. If you have already fulfilled your role during the course of the mission, your HP oh, and your HP is equal to one, you may immediately advance now instead of when the mission ends. You get a Mercury Core Executioner Sword, which deals 1d6 plus force damage and two max HP. That is is awesome. Uh, there's, there's moments when you're pinned down and things look dire and then you find a way out of it are always cool in movies. And uh, uh, an Executioner Sword that deals plus force damage is, is nothing to sneeze at. Um, now let's try what's the second trait here. One, two, two. Boop, 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 boop. Animus. Your, your touch grants sapience. Once permission, you may touch an object or animal to give it human intelligence, movement, and speech. Those you awaken in this way are under no obligation to take it well. You get a lighter, which is your longtime companion, and bonus to creative. A plus one bonus to creative. What a character. So... You're someone who has like like this kind of like Mercury core sword. And when pushed to the limit, you can just like advance mid level. You can flavor that a lot of ways. Like it could be like, I don't know, like maybe one of your like a, like a space person or an alien or something who has some kind of like evolutionary powers uh, and uh, awakening inanimate objects or animals also kind of goes with some kind of like ancient alien astronaut theme. Uh, you know, some like precursor species of aliens that go around uplifting species and stuff that could work. Um, or it could be, I mean, for one thing, you could grant sapience to your Mercury core sword, and now you have. Um, a sword with human intelligence, movement, and speech. And since it's under no obligation to take it well, now you have you could have an argumentative sword. Uh, it could be, you know, calling for blood in, in opportune situations. There's a lot of stuff you could do with just those two. Uh, since I did say I'd do a couple pages, I think I'll just roll up an, another, like, couple of... Okay, so one, two, three. That's cool. Uh, what do we got for our next character? One, two, three. Aquatic. You're a water breather, perhaps due to spliced on fish genes or cybernetic gills, and you may stage submerged indefinitely with no ill effects. When you roll the dice to do something risky underwater, roll 3d6 and take the best two. On land, roll 3d6 and take the worst two. You start with a heavy harpoon launcher and your plus one forceful. Um, back when I was making fist pregens based on the cast of the Hellboy movies. Uh, I forget if aquatic was a thing, but that's definitely like an Abe friendly um, trait. Okay, so I'm aquatic. I've got a harpoon, a heavy harpoon launcher. I'm forceful. I'm, I'm a bit of a beefcake. I'm definitely seeing like mid 90s era Aquaman when like they tried to rebrand and like make him cool. And they're like, no, Aquaman's not lame. He's got like a beard and long blonde hair. And one of his hands is like a harpoon hook. Aquaman's badass. 
And you know what? I thought he was kind of badass. I, I went for it. I fell for it. I was like, yeah. So maybe I'm just a 90s Aquaman. Um, let's see what my second grade is. Hopefully, okay, five, six, one. Five, six, one, statuesque. I'm made of something hard, stone, mather, metal, gems, etc. Once permission, you can reflect any projectile attack at the attacker. If you are also wearing armor, decrease your reflexive score by two. You have a tough exterior with two armor. Doesn't count as equipped. Uh, there is a limit to how many types of armor you can have. So I believe this means you could, you have two natural armor and you could throw on like a bulletproof vest on top of that. And you get plus one forceful. Aquatic and statuesque. Oh, that's cool. So now I'm thinking I'm like one of those like submerged, like, you know, off the coast of the Mediterranean, they'll have like submerged statues and stuff. What if it's like that? Like you were, ooh, here's an idea. <clears throat> here's an idea. Maybe you were like the statue dedicated to some kind of like sea god and you're animated maybe that first character came by and granted you intelligence right so you're you're made out of stone you've got a harpoon gun you can you don't have to breathe underwater which makes sense because you're actually a statue and in kind of like a buzz light you kind of a way you think that you are like the god of the sea like you you won't admit or acknowledge that you're just a reproduction or dedicated to this guy you're like no i am you know poseidon or whatever uh and like everyone around you is like you're clearly a statue uh so that could be like some fun inner party conflict where you're like you know mortals stand back and they're like dude you are a reproduction like <laughs> settle down there buddy um i think that would be i mean i would be thrilled so as you can see like even though i think like the the initial idea for this game was very much like a cold war metal gear solid um you know psycho mantis paranormal kind of a thing the traits are, are really out there and would loan themselves uh, lend themselves to horror to sci-fi superhero there's a lot of ways to flavor fist especially with the more out there uh, traits um if you have your heart set on a less um colorful cast of characters there's nothing stopping you from creating a curated list of traits uh, like I said, this game is extremely easy to hack. You could come up with like 36 traits that are more or less just normal. Um, like let's let's find let's find you some normal stuff. Technique. Uh, you your special technique targets a series of critical pressure points. When you would deal damage, you can choose to roll 2d6 and execute your technique instead. On a nine or below, you deal more damage. If you roll 10 or more, the victim in instantly dies. So that's like, um, you know, that's like a like a nerve strike. What's that called? The dim mock technique or something. Uh, that's very like a tattered gi. It's very like martial arts. Uh, that's not nearly as out there as like say Summoner. Or you could have, um, dun, 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 dun. or like Scout. You always get the lay of the land before mission. You can find a good vantage point or hiding place anywhere, anytime. The referee will always tell you about ambushes and hidden traps. There you go. Um, you know, there's plenty of mundane yet powerful traits you can pick if you don't want to go out there. But I say embrace it. Like everyone needs to see a skeleton in action skeletons are the unofficial mascot of fist and uh you know just let him let him be a skeleton it's fine it's not gonna break anything all right so that is my totally cheating other two page spread i just took all these pages and i made a couple of characters to show you've got uh perhaps like this kind of like i don't know martian manhunter story but let's just go with him uh this kind of like ancient alien kind of a, a species maybe he, he got like crash landed on the planet and uh was like sent to earth like you know millions of years ago to kind of like guide evolution and he got like frozen in a tar pit or something i don't know uh and now, now he's back and he's like going around like taking people's staplers and, and making them talk uh, and maybe uh, he, he's the one that um, brought the statue to life. Who knows? But you can do 
so many cool, fun characters in this game. And like I said, traits are, I think, the the heart and soul of, of Fist. And without traits, it would be a completely different game. I don't think it would be nearly as fun. They're they're what beyond like the pitch of a paranormal mercenary game, traits are what really made me like take notice all those years ago. And it's great to see that Ultra has added so many more traits. Um, and the fan community adds more and more every day. So also check out uh, the Discord. Uh, next, I would like to highlight the rules summary. Um, more of that kind of like, we've done the work for you approach. Oftentimes when people are learning a new game, they hop on the forums, they hop on social media and they say, hey, has anyone got a GM screen? Anybody got a player cheat sheet? Uh, this book has so many pages and I can't fit them all in my head. And here we have a two page spread. You could print this out, post it on the back of a GM screen. You could just leave it lay sitting on the table. And not only does it have like the premise, which is kind of cool. You don't usually see like the premise of a game on a cheat sheet. But if you were going to run a demo, a con game, if you just wanted to like introduce people to this at, a, at your game show, at the, if you just wanted to introduce Fist Ultra to folks at a game store and you know somebody sits across the table from you and they go, so what's this game about? You could blank, right? You could be like, uh, it's got uh, statues and you can make a stapler talk. Uh, and then you just like get up and you, you excuse yourself, you go to the bathroom, you climb out the window, uh, you hop in your car, you go home and you never talk about it again. But thankfully, Fist Ultra Edition has the premise right there. So this, this won't happen. You can look that person in the eyes and tell them that in Fist, you portray a team of paranormal mercenaries doing jobs that no one else can or that no one else wants. In the military espionage ecosystem of the Cold War, you're an unconventional kind of mercenary who cares more about being true to yourself, your community, or your ideals than turning a profit. And you may have been forced into this line of work due to incompatibility with nonviolent, non-paranormal society. That's good. Uh, and then a little bit about, you know, gameplay and stuff. That's, that's cool. I like that a lot. Uh, character creation. Quick little guide. Like I said, making a character super quick uh, a little bit on traits and roles um i mean when you're getting first getting started you can get those two mixed up no problem here we have playing the game uh this is nice some bolding um i could see like in the heat of the moment you're like wait which one's partial if you're unfamiliar with powered by the apocalypse you could be like oh what's failure again is it five or six right there it's bolded um Right there, it's it's bolded. Uh, you, did a, you got combat and death. That's nice. Um, even in, in games without a separate combat system such as this, I think people naturally kind of panic at the lack of like dedicated combat subsystems like like D and D. Uh, when I write a game with like a universal resolution system and no like separate combat engine, I will always do like a paragraph on how to handle combat because it, people have a natural inclination towards assuming there's like a whole separate way to play like let's bust out the grid you know let's start going turn based instead of real time and it can help especially in like the heat of the moment which is what these cheat sheet kind of deals are all about to be like oh wait um if a player is engaged in active combat uh rolling a failure always incurs damage that is um this is a new addition to ultra i believe where rolling six or below will always get you hurt um Players do not take regimented turns, but should avoid hogging the spotlight with combat actions. Enemies controlled by the ref never roll to attack, but telegraph attacks for players to respond to. That's a little bit like a natural language version of a Powered by the Apocalypse, like hard and soft move kind of a deal, like telegraphing uh, attacks, you know, that would be like kind of like a soft move. And then here we have, a, for example, the guard aims a rifle at you or the vampire bears her fangs. Examples are great. And I like multiple examples even better. And then we have like more rules summary over here. Uh, rendezvous points is rendezvous points is new to Fist Ultra. It's kind of like, it's basically like sort of like your, your rest system. 
Uh, once permission, players may request a rendezvous point and the referee will describe a nearby but difficult to reach safe location where the players can recuperate. Uh, I'm running my first fist campaign as opposed to a one shot right now. My players, my player characters are quite beat up and I'm wondering if anyone is going to bring up the possibility of getting a rendezvous point. I don't necessarily want to suggest it myself. I just want kind of want to see if, if they, if they come up with it. Here's running the game. Here's, this is really interesting. Making missions, right? A rule summary with tips on how to make missions. You almost never see this. Uh, but like I said, like you could probably just print these two pages and leave the rest of the book at home. Uh, or like not have to constantly page the book. So having a little like making a mission hint right here could be really cool. This is, this is great. Um, I was a big fan of fifth second editions, like default enemies. These are a little bit different right here. Um, um, yeah. And then like, here's a little bit about Cyclops, you know, these are kind of like Cyclops is going to be like, it's like G.I. Joe versus Cobra. They're kind of like your go-to uh, villains. Um, you could print this, these two pages out, and hand them to, uh, your players as like a little thingy. Anyway. Yeah. So I'm all about rule summaries. Um, moving on. Up next, I'm going to highlight the optional rules. This is also new to Ultra. Uh, they have a couple of really fun ones, uh, starting with Chopter Chatter. Uh, I use this in my very first and, and currently ongoing Fist Ultra campaign. Uh, begin each mission with a scene inside the Merc's mode of transport, often a helicopter, but it could be anything. If a player describes their character discussing the mission with their comrades, they start with an extra war dice. I like to open up my, uh, I like to open up scenarios, especially one shots with the party having already taken the job but then you give them a little free form role playing. So it's not like go to a tavern and like awkwardly meet up with each other one by one and hail traveler. Oh, you're also an adventure. Like that stuff can take forever. And it can also be like really awkward, especially for new players. But if you give everyone like the goal off the bat, like, yeah, this is what you're doing. You're already headed there. But all that said, you know, everyone's got the, the, the buy-in and we're already we're doing it you know the social contract has been signed but now we're going to give everybody like a like a little moment in the spotlight to either highlight some stuff about your own character maybe ask some other people about their character and in, in fist you got some pretty freaking colorful characters so if like some guys over there with like a uh, like a sword or, or some gals like talking to like a like a raven or if there's just like a like a alien monster or something you know you can be like uh hey friend what's what's your deal over there um and you know this also kind of discussing the mission that's also a moment for people to talk tactics and strategy if they want i don't know i, I really like that and uh, i'm just gonna say now don't limit this to chopper chatter right uh you don't need uh, a helicopter. You don't need a mode of transport. This could just be like psh, you're teleported on scene. You have a short walk to, you know, I don't know, the convenience store where a small black hole is stealing all the candy bars, whatever. Uh, and during that brief hike, go ahead and talk to each other. Uh, so yeah, I really like that. Exploding war dies is another option. Um, strict initiative is something I've, I've spoken about before. Another uh, right up here, non-insertion zone. This goes with the new emergency insertion rules. For moments of high tension, the, ref uh, here, the referee may declare certain areas and scenes to be non-insertion zones, such as boss fights or heavily guarded choke 
points. Emergency insertion is not possible in NI zones, fo forcing players who roll die to spectate as others continue to play. Spectating players are granted war dice equal to their HP immediately before their death. E.g. taking 5 damage with 3 HP grants 3 war die. Spectators should assign each of their war dice to moments they'd like to see in the NI zone, such as a melee backflip attack or try to talk down the boss. If you are spectating and a player completes one of these optional objectives, give them the corresponding war dice or war die. Return when the threat is neutralized or all living players have left the NI zone. That is pretty darn clever. Um, I like that a lot. And like, plus like this can be happening while you're working on your character that will eventually be inserted into the game. I like the idea of like players kind of like sticking around as like ghosts or like narrative ghosts and kind of like bribing people to basically like do achievements. <laughs> um, that, that's really neat. Uh, I would I would suggest because here's what happens is you know you don't want like in the middle of an extended boss fight to have people die and then the player like immediately drops a new character and then it could be funny <laughs> it could be funny if someone keeps dying and dropping new characters into the game but I think it would maybe take away from the seriousness of the battle obviously whatever works for you but I would suggest this uh, using this for like really dangerous or narratively important scenes otherwise you won't get those like grim moments where the party is like you know one by one being taken out uh and last but not least uh sudden death you know sudden death and i we get along really good um i would this has changed slightly, I think. Uh, when a PC rolls snake eyes, two ones, during combat, the mode of play shifts to sudden death. During sudden death, all damage is doubled after applying any other bonuses, and armor is rendered useless by the force of incredible violence. Sudden death applies to everyone and lasts until someone dies. Oh, yeah. Um, I haven't actually tried this out since the, uh, the beta test. Since... Alas, poor Holland. Uh, I like it a lot, though. And it, it's kind of like an interesting like counterpart to the new uh, emergency insertion rules where uh, two sixes is like very, very good. Sudden death, two ones. Uh, it'd be interesting if someone rolled snake eyes and they got killed. And then when they had their character come back in for an emergency insertion... They rolled two sixes. It'd be like from just like the, the lowest low to the highest high. Yeah, all these optional rules are cool. Definitely give them a look. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few more things before I go on here. There is a much more expanded mission generator. Um, actually, this book is so cool. It's kind of causing me to abandon my usual highlight five spreads format because there's just there's too much. Um, here's some more great sketches by B. The, oh, weapon tags are also new. Uh, some of these are pretty powerful. They almost feel like, um, self-contained traits. And if you were to combine the right ta weapon tag with the, with the right trait, it would be pretty darn unstoppable. Um, I would maybe personally suggest not just giving these away willy-nilly especially if you're just getting into the game um maybe save them more for objectives uh like super duper upgrades i think it even says down here uh weapon tags are special game mechanics which can be attached to any weapon broadening its functions and giving its handling a distinct feel no tag is required for a weapon to have a special effects for instance, the villain in your campaign may have a gravity canyon. 1d6 plus 2 damage, 1 in 6 chance to crush the target into a marble. But those 36 modifications are meant to cover some of the more commonly thought of special abilities in Random Table. You may use them as an advancement rewards, as the inventory of a gunsmith NPC, or to generate memorable lackeys and loot for a mission. 
And that's actually the way I I would handle it. Once again, kind of a personal preference thing. But I think it's I think it's like more interesting if you use weapon tags as something to build towards. Or um if you wanted to, you could even do something like uh like a variation on the scar system for Mark of the Odd games where like you know if if somebody like just off the top of my head like if a character died you could give them like a 1d6 roll or something and if they got a six then it'd be like they they went to some kind of like afterlife other realm other dimension and they like came back with like this weird new tag uh like they came back changed and now they're you know menacing or electrified or whatever um weapon tags are cool uh they're definitely good for like boss weapons um oh uh one this is like a little bit of a um bit of a tip for y'all uh you'll see here loud attacks with this weapon draw the undivided attention of enemies with an earshot um i've seen uh some at least one person ask well aren't all guns loud don't gun all guns draw attention unless they are you know unless it's a silencer and the answer is like this is loud like this is like a cannon this is not just like a gunshot in the distance that might be mistaken for a backfiring car right this is like everyone within you know 20 blocks just heard you fire whatever kind of weird science space cannon makes a loud noise so um yeah louder and loud right there moving on there are so many good tables this whole section the intelligent matrix uh you've got you know enemies you've got hazards you've got celebrities and civilians there's some cool names uh, i recommend everybody have a nice little names list fist ultra also introduces a, a whole uh bunch of pre-made enemies and we're talking bosses here's like a big kind of kraken with titanic tentacles uh all this is great um i always love the art here and these aren't just like i would say these aren't just like the normal <laughs> these aren't just like the normal kind of enemies um these are definitely fist ultra enemies this is one of my favorites the corrupt accountant perhaps they are foil if you have one a player with the accountant trait and uh then in the back we just have tons and tons and tons more tables weapon skins uh cassette tapes mission prompts and then we have you know a grid map and the the new character sheet which i actually like i like better than the the old one um and you can find uh i i did a form fillable version of this that's now bundled with the game yeah and end of transmission all right so rest well murdoch oh i don't know what the story behind that is i'm sad um final thoughts fist ultra is just nothing but improvements i own two copies of the fist second revision i don't know i think as soon as i get uh, a physical copy of a fist ultra edition i probably won't have much of a reason to open up those originals right like i just i think this is just like all around a vast improvement i haven't spotted anything where i'm like oh the original did it better uh, which is which is rare, you know, um, and not just because Fizz Ultra is like technically like almost completely compatible. Uh, a lot of times, even when compatibility is maintained, things change, and you're like, I don't know about that. Uh, the addition of some much needed rules like emergency insertion, uh, the tons of the D six sixty six table of, of traits uh the the bestiary the the mission generator stuff the tables and tables and tables um you know there's a there's an infinite amount of 
fantasy adventure random tables out there, right? Not nearly as much modern age stuff. So if there's if there's anything I would suggest like improvement wise or anything like I'm not like super keen on uh, because this review has largely been nothing but compliments. Um, I do notice the one thing I sort of preferred in, in second revision and you can see here is the font has gotten a little bit smaller. Like we're at a hundred percent down here and you can see, you know, creating a character. And if you go over to the non-spread ultra version, still a hundred percent, it's just, it's a little bit, it feels a little bit more cramped to me. Uh, this is about, you know, with, with my, uh, with my eyes, this is about as small as I would want. And I, I realize on the screen, I can zoom in. I, I just, I worry a little bit that this might be getting kind of small for the page, but, uh, the, the fifth second revision book was was a pretty good size um so it's not like this is going to be like a, a six by nine book i don't believe um it, it probably will be perfectly readable when it's printed but i would i would maybe like say this is about as small as i would like the text to get uh, besides the font being just slightly cramped um this is a minor complaint, but like all these pages have intelligent matrix up here. I'm not really sure how useful that is. Uh, like, I think if I was just like flipping through the book and I'm looking for the mission generator, this is what I would want to be in, in big and bold letters, mission generator, you know, Cyclops gear and gadgets. Uh, it seems like it'd be an easy fix. I'm not sure if that's something that B would want to do or I mean, I'm sure she's got, you know, she put a lot of thought into the layout here, um, which overall, I really like the layout. Like, I like, this is kind of a, just a fun detail. Like, I like how it's kind of like this, it looks recessed and kind of the whole rounded rectangle thing is good. I did spot like one typo, but I spoke with B and there's going to be uh, like a few, you know, typo corrections after this. Um, uh, this um, version of Fist Ultra comes from, I think, May 4th is the last time it was updated. There's probably going to be a few more like little typos. As far as gameplay goes, it is all locked in. All right, so that, I mean, the font's slightly too small, and I don't know about these big old intelligence matrices. Is that is that really, is that really my complaints? Uh, kind of, yeah. Like, I'm... <laughs> I'm just super happy with Fist Ultra Edition. And I, I think with the added random table content, I mean, you know me, I love random mission generators, uh, with these latest updates, right? I think Fist Ultra has graduated from like, oh yeah, it's like one of my favorite rules like games, or oh yeah, I'd, I'd totally be down with running that. I now think like, I'm kind of thinking Fist Ultra Edition might be like, like we're talking like top five material, right? Like I think at this point, it's like Fist Ultra has been like, it has risen into like a desert island if you had five games kind of material. Because I don't know. I mean, if I was going to run like any kind of like, like a mercenary versus supernatural or like Hellboy kind of a thing, um, this, there's just so much stuff. Mech alligator. I mean, there's just so much content in this book. Pacific Theater Ghost. Uh, serial killer. So, uh, Fist Ultra Edition overall review. This game is magnificent. The Ultra Edition has added just an unbelievable amount of content. Like, mechanically, I'm like super down with this game. Uh, granted, I haven't like tried like each and every trait. Um, there's bound to be like some troublesome traits out there. Track down those troublesome traits with your group and, and discuss it with them. Uh, you know, and sure it'd be easy to, to change anything or maybe they're all rock solid and you don't have to change a darn thing because this game is very well, it's well tested. Um, um, if you, and if you happen to back any of one of several itch.io bundles in the past couple of years chances are you already have this because if you had 
Fist second revision in your itch.io account, you now have Fist Ultra Edition. It is right there. It's ready to go. So go check it out. There is going to be a physical version coming soon to various storefronts and uh, I think some other plans down the line. So I'm just going to say go get yourself a copy of Fist Ultra Edition. Keep an eye out because there's some cool Fist Ultra Edition stuff on the way, which... Uh, I, I may I may be writing a little some more stuff. I've already you know I've already published a couple of free PDFs, the, the Nest Adventure, and if you're getting started, there's there's a ton of great GM advice in Ultra Edition out of the box. But if you need a little bit more, uh, I'll link to my Beginner Referee Toolkit. You can get that for free. It's got some like three more starting adventures of different kinds and uh, some advice. Specifically for like if your group is used to basically, you know, if your group's used to D&D 5e, like how can you get them to play something so different? And I've got some advice in there um, because once once your your group gets over like the initial like culture shock of swapping from D20 fantasy to like gritty 2D6 <laughs> super mercenary weirdness uh they 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 might not want to go back you know they might just want to be an exploding skeleton uh who needs to be a rogue when you can be uh a statue that thinks it's poseidon and uh that's about it so uh 10 out of 10 five stars is my super biased opinion well done b you have pulled off a hell of a game. Well done to everybody who uh, who chipped in along the way. So until next time, I am Jamie, aka Brandoff, the off-brand Gandalf. I have no idea how to end these reviews.